when you grow up in Israel, um, the entire education system is priming you to become part of a national project of erasure and dispossession. Um, there are things that you simply are not told, and you understand that state ideology requires a certain narrative and requires certain epistemic erasure, meaning like erasure of history, erasure of people, erasure of the truth that you actually see in front of your eyes. It's an old saying in journalism, all governments lie. So how do you prove a government is lying? Today on Downstream, I'm joined by Ayel Weitzman, Director of Forensic Architecture and Professor of Spatial and Visual Cultures at Goldsmiths, University of London. Whether it's Assad's torture prison or Israel's assault on Gaza, forensic architecture brings together open source intelligence, civilian video, witness testimony and more to build evidence-based 3D models of contested events. They're able to reconstruct events as they happened. These reconstructions are so diligently put together that they can and have been used in court. I hope you enjoy the interview. When I hear the word architecture, yeah. I think about columns and I think about cantilevers. Yeah. And then I went to the Forensic Architecture Exhibition in 2016 at the ICA. Yeah. And I realized that yeah. what I was seeing was a kind of crime scene investigation, mm. except the perpetrator mm. was the government. How did this method of investigation come out of an art and design discipline? Yeah, this is a very good question, and uh, I'm often wondering myself, but one of the origins of forensic architecture is actually in the anti-colonial movement in Palestine. And like many things that come out of Palestine, um, there are moments of invention there. And I think together with colleagues, um, we obviously understood something that would be obvious to anyone that, that travels through uh, any part of Palestine, whether it's Gaza, Palestine of 48, Jerusalem, or the West Bank, those uh, areas that Israel actually kind of carves it into in different administrative zones. But in all of them, you see that the, the practice of settler colonization is architectural, that, that the domination of Palestine, the violence is... Um, enacted through the way in which space is configured. That is to say, the way that where roads go and where they don't go, the settlements, the colonies in relation to indigenous Palestinian villages, how they uh, cut them apart, surround them, sometimes being put on hilltops in order to survey them. The wall, of course, the checkpoints, the valleys, the hills, everything is almost like a political plastic meaning political plastic is the way in which the space is configured is a kind of diagram of an attempt to control and dominate a population. So how would it look? I mean, from a bird's eye view, how would you see that imposed on the landscape? Well, you know, like Israel, the establishment uh, of Israel is based on the erasure of historical Palestine on the depopulation of Palestinian towns uh, and villages, and the imposing of a new geography, a new urban system, a new transport system, uh, a new meaning, new set of names, new maps uh, on top of that area. And that is a huge construction project. And architecture includes both destruction and construction. So what you see as the acts of the bulldozers when they carve new routes through the center of Janine and destroy the refugee camp in order to make a road so that the area could be better policed is so an it's act wide of enough architecture. For the tanks to go through. Exactly. Wide enough for tanks or armored vehicles to go through is an act of architecture. When uh, you see a settlement overlooking uh, or surrounding Janine or any other um, city in the occupied territories or in 48, you know that these places have been designed on the drawing boards of architects, that they've been 
crimes uh, and to my understanding war crimes committed on the drawing boards uh, and that civilian architects have been drafted into a national project and when the crime is architectural architectural understanding allows you to unpack it because architecture is not only a set of design techniques it's a is a way of seeing the world as a built reality is a way to see the relation between culture and built form between politics power and um, and the way in which matter physical matter buildings neighborhood cities are organized across the terrain so the project really began with a certain mapping a very detailed mapping of the physical reality of Israeli uh, colonization techniques uh, initially in the West Bank but then in in other places um, acts of mappings for which I personally needed and my colleagues too to The skills that we learned in architectural schools we need to know we needed to know how to draw plans so first of all how to read the plans that the Israeli civilian architects were drawing in order to dominate and control but also to make a counter map a certain counter cartography and I remember it was the project began very much at the beginning of the second Intifada when Edward said in a in a in an essay that kind of changed my life back in in the in early 2000 sorry in late 2000 uh, maybe it was in December so a few months after the beginning of the second Intifada he was calling for a, a counter cartography of Palestine so what would counter cartography mean what would go on this counter map exactly so so you know if you think of maps as the instrument of colonialism no I mean if you want to colonize a place you need to know where things are you draw a map you plan where you're going what what land you're going to take and how you're going to inhabit it and therefore the history of cartography is very associated with the history of Empire and colonization but what you choose to draw, And what you choose to withdraw from a map is a political decision so counter cartography enter into that choice and rather than uh, simply mapping the areas to be colonized it actually comes to expose the mechanism of colonization so in a sense if you if you think about it like that colonization is always a double crime it's a crime against people and And territory and it's a crime against the truth that the crime has it all taken place so it's a kind of a mechanism of erasure physical erasure and epistemic erasure that is it it actually hides and 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 wipes the facts of its own wrongdoing I mean to put and it very needs, crudely it would yeah. be like you know the results of the Berlin conference or something producing a map of Africa which says oh sorry like this actually belongs to us like it's also yeah. on this piece of paper and yeah. if you're a native yeah. African you go what the fuck yeah yeah many people you know while they were sitting in Berlin carving maps through for Africa at the invitation of Bismarck uh, th- those people whose land was now renamed um, re-demarcated Uh, were not consulted they did not know about it they did not participate their voice was not heard and the only thing left for them was to resist and the resistance is both on the ground and in the level of representation so indigenous struggle always needed to have its own set of cartography it always needed to represent to take over the means of production right we were speaking about about Marxism before no I mean if Marxism is about you know taking the means of the working classes taking the means of production we're talking about taking over the means of evidence production making sure that we can tell the story and that we can expose the crime from the point of view of those that actually you Um, experience and are violated by that and therefore a project of of the cartography of the occupation began as a Palestinian Israeli international or you know kind of coalition of anti-colonial activists who actually for the first time in in 2002 we released this map in for the first time there was a map that showed every settlement was in where the area they plan to expand to and what is the spatial logic behind it we were showing something that was called the matrix of control how you know you create a matrix in which each settlement can see the next one from one hilltop to the next 
connected in roads between them in a way that completely bypassed the Palestinian geography and dominated it through this matrix. You don't need, in order to occupy space, you don't need to control the entire surface. It's enough to apply force like an acupuncturist mm -hmm. in important nodal points, an important nexus of forces and movement. And through those points, you paralyze and control the, the, uh, the territory. And you need to have some kind of architectural or spatial knowledge or sensibility, at least, in order to understand that. Because you were born and raised in Israel. So if you'd like, you were growing up inside that map. Yeah. Was it the case that studying architecture allowed you to see the context that you grew up in? Or was there something, I don't know, intuitive or something that started a lot earlier where you were looking around you and went, hang on, this, this is violent. The situation I'm in is yeah, violent. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, when you're a kid, you're a kid. You, you, you know, I wanted to study architecture. I didn't know exactly why I was attracted to it. I was attracted to building. I was very tactile as a person. Um, you know, I could sketch. So, you know, I was attracted to that. On the other hand, what I really enjoyed about Haifa was, unlike many other cities um, in Palestine that, you know, that turned into Israeli cities, there were remnants of Palestinian communities that survived the expulsions of the Nakba. So I wouldn't say, you know, sometimes they call them by national, but by no means they're by national cities. No, I mean, the Palestinian communities there is really disenfranchised and on so many levels, including space. But there was a pleasure in proximity, no? And there was a pleasure in discovery. And there was an understanding that the way that Haifa as a city was conceived with the Jewish sort of middle class neighborhoods where I you know, grew up, where at the top of the hill, the Palestinians were in the valley, very circumscribed, very contained, um, where the density there, you know, kind of almost exploded because building permits were not, were not given, it was almost like the source code of what I started to understand I'm seeing in the occupied territories, the Israeli settlements on the hilltop, the Palestinians in the valley circumscribed and bypassed. And there was a kind of almost like the genetic code of colonization was already visible to me in Haifa. So it's not, Haifa is not, you know, every city is different. But I think that when you grow up, the contours, the architecture, the characters of the city in which you grow enter into your conscious and the way you understand the world. So, you know, wherever you go, it's Haifa for me, no, <laughs> in a certain way. Um, so it's it's very much to that city that I owe my my spatial kind of imagination that a what I'm seeing is not simply benign buildings. That everything that seems benign and utilitarian, a road, a bridge, uh, a building, a neighborhood, is actually a political act, um, and. Also, I owe to Haifa the insight that maybe someday a kind of an equal non-apartheid, you know, sort of like living together would be possible. And uh, so, so I guess with, with those two things, I, I've, you know, I've combined that. And, and of course, you know, you know, I, I see the, the bookcase behind you here, I guess, you know, I could have probably... If I would know about if I would know about Novara Media, if it would be there, I'd probably ask for an internship because that's the kind of stuff I was reading as a, you know, in the sort of our you know Marxist kind of youth movement. I mean, forensic architecture itself is a multidisciplinary research group. So mm. you've got architects, mm. you've got mm. designers, you've got filmmakers, yeah. software developers, investigative journalists. How did that come together? Was it like, you know, the bit in the heist movie where the guy has to go out and be like, right, you, you're the safe cracker and you're the getaway driver oh, yeah, 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 and you're yeah, yeah. the, was it like that? You know, every problem in the world need to create a community of practice to address it because every problem is unique and some problems need... Um, a botanist or gardener in order to understand the way in which plants, in a particular case, 
register evidence or participate in a mode of erasure or, or destruction. So you bring that person on. And um, But that's an analogy because what we've realized when very fast is that you know, imagine we started doing that work in the early 2000s. We were doing maps by drawing lines still on plans. And cartography disappeared on us two years later. You know, we're working for more than a year. And it was a risky practice moving across the occupied territories between Palestinian villages and, and the roads. And, you know, we were... You know, it was dangerous to, to, to drive along the roads, you know, like the army was there and people could mistake you from both sides. We were replacing the kafia on the, on the car with uh, taking it on and off in order for people not to identify us. But almost when the map was finished, uh, a new technological kind of, you know, provision was, was made available and that's satellite images. So think about the world before that. Now, now it's so, you know, People of, of a different generation don't even remember what it means not living with, with satellite images. But satellite images did away with cartography. There was no maps anymore. Maps were not necessary. And cartography turns into photography because a satellite image is a photograph. And every photograph, when you analyze a photograph, you need to ask some question. Why is the cameras there? What kind of lens it is? Um, what resolution it is? Why is it in a particular place? Why is it taking this picture and not that picture? And you can ask those questions to satellite images who are kind of sometimes gravitating towards war zones and sometimes with coarse resolution hide things that are inconvenient. For example, Israel has lobbied with the US to actually regulate satellite images over Israel and its occupied territories to be coarse enough so that its violations would not be seen from above. So in a sense, it becomes counter, cartography becomes counter forensics because the move into, um, into photography was important. And then a few years later, it was a social media revolution and all those videos and photographs were everywhere online and analysis of violation had to start contending with those photographs and different questions were asked. Where is this video taken from? By whom? What does it show? How does it link to? Or is it synchronized with another video? And then you realize that when the most important evidence is photographic or videographic, the people that you need are image practitioners. And who are the image practitioners? Curators and photographers and filmmakers and artists. Uh, and that's why we insisted on including artists in our, you know, in um, what we call this kind of communities of practice, this sort of investigative collectives, the investigative commons, um, and, and arrange around an investigation, a combination of practitioners from a curator, an artist, a filmmaker, an architect, a lawyer, um, a f you know, a physicist, a, a medical doctor, because the question defines the community. You don't have a certain skill and wait for things to, to come at you in a way that you can kind of respond or, or resolve them. You need to build, you need to have the flexibility to build a committed um you know, kind of very attuned um, collective around a particular case. So every case is also a social production. And the people that work in our, in, in forensic architecture, some of them work in our office, but there's so many collaborators all over the world because each one of our cases is about establishing communities that, that build those investigation and searching those relation with the people at the forefront of struggle. And this is why we also were working with Stafford Scott because the, what, what, what Stafford could understand very fast by looking at a video, you know, it, even a trained analyst would take weeks to kind of like um, to understand or to unpack. And where does that skill come from for him? Is it just the depth of experience or is there something intuitive you know, it's sort of like a, a natural God-given talent. Situated experience, like being there with every case, with every family that has been bereaved by 
British policing, uh, by living through it again and again and again and again, by being through and with families in in their legal struggles or in the political struggles or advocacy struggles and, and gaining the kind of, you know, this sort of understanding, situated understanding of a situation. And, you know, in Palestine, forensic architecture now works. We, we've helped establish in Al-Haq, uh, the first and biggest uh, Palestinian human rights group. Uh, I think it was founded in 1979, probably the first in the Arab-speaking world. And um, now criminally, I mean, outrageously, they are considered a terrorist group by the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Terrorist of what? Terrorist of, of truth, of, of, of documentation, of community relation, but be that it's made, they're considered terrorists. But together with them, we have established the Al-Haq Forensic Architecture Unit because we understand that our techniques cannot be, and our investigation cannot be done from London remotely. Some things could be done from London, from our studio here in, 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 at Goldsmiths. Uh, but some of them need the kind of understanding that only situatedness can provide, the kind of intelligence, the kind of trust, the kind of connection, the kind of trained eye and lived experience that would allow you to understand something. Without that, we're just kind of like experts, like, you know, from 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 the BBC or the media, without, without those connections right there uh, on the ground. And this is why... Building those communities is a political project. And we don't only investigate political incidents, we investigate politically. That is to say, the way we investigate need to validate the kind of things that we are trying to achieve, you know, whether it's Palestine liberation, if we're talking about Palestine, whether we work in Mexico, where we have now another office, or in Bogota, where we have an office and we worked with a with a truth commission, or in Turkey, where we build one, or in Greece, where we work on, on issues of migration, or in France, where we work in a Bali. There always has to be, the investigations have to be done with people that know what the lived experience of a certain type of violation is. There's an old saying in journalism, which is, all governments lie. All governments lie all the time. And for me, I came to understand that when I was in my teens and I first started participating in political activism and I realized the police lie. Mm. And then the media print the police's lie. Mm. And then mm. the government mm. forms policy on the basis of those media reports, which were police lies. And that was when I kind of got that journalistic principle embedded in my bones, which is government's lie. Skepticism. When did you first start mistrusting state narratives? When did that skepticism come in for you? Um, you know, when you grow up in Israel, um, the entire education system is priming you to become part of a national project of erasure and dispossession. Um, there are things that you simply are not told. Uh, you are lied to, and then you see the reality in front of you. You're told, you're told that, oh, you know, that bunch of ruins, when you drive out of Haifa towards the, on, on, on the main coastal highway, and you see those ruins, they say these are Byzantine ruins, and you go like, did the Byzantine have mosques? Um, and and who are those people that lived here, and where are they? And uh, these kind of questions are not provided to you, and you understand that state ideology requires a certain narrative and requires certain epistemic erasure, meaning like erasure of history, erasure of people, erasure of the truth that you actually see in front of your eyes. And I think that, you know, sometimes you say, but I can see the truth, it is there, and I hear something else being told about what it is that I see. But I think that our seeing is very ideologically conditioned. I think that when you hear enough of the framing around a particular, whether it's a photograph, or it's a bit of landscape, or it's a ruined Palestinian village, 
Um, I think that there are ways to make you see other things in in that reality. And I think that, you know, it's true also to an extent that when when videos are made public of violations, whether it is in London, a, a murder in Tottenham or um a police murder in Tottenham or or uh, something in, in Mexico in, or, in, or in Gaza, you I don't think people yet have the attention to actually look, actually see the image, look at it for what it shows. I think that it feels like the image is too obvious and too obviously described by the caption that you get and you don't see, you just trust what you hear or what you read about it. And a lot of what we do is developing a very close attention to things, um, respecting the world for what it is and respecting the fact that the art of seeing is hard. It's not obvious. You need to work hard to see what you see. We, you need to work hard to make public what is already public. Uh, and that is uh, a principle of, of care, uh, of attention, of time. And, and yes, yeah, spending, spending time with, with a problem and with the people that actually ask you for, for help about it. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second yeah. and pretend I'm a BBC journalist who thinks that there's such a yeah. thing as impartial journalism. Yeah. So I understand your point that what we see in our interpretation of evidence is ideologically conditioned. Yeah. And that can be in the state's interest. It can be in a corporation's interest. It can yeah. be in the interest of capitalism more broadly. But if you're working with a group of ideologically motivated individuals who have their area of expertise, is there a danger of them interpreting the evidence in the way which they want to interpret the evidence? How do you navigate that? How do you always there's there is there is all there, let's say there isn't seeing there isn't even an act of seeing and of noticing that is not conditioned, culturally conditioned and part of Culture is ideology, but not only. So, um, but what actually make a piece of evidence strong is when you start weaving multiple perspectives. There's a polyperspectival construction. And this is when architecture becomes crucial. Because if I would only have to analyze a single video and notice something in it or not, like you remember this film Blow Up, no? When you kind of, mm -hmm. Antonioni, no? You zoom in, you zoom in, and you see the gun or the body, no? Hiding in the pixels or oh, in the grains the, uh, of the image. Enhance. That's the bit yeah. in the movies. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of zoom in to, to, to something and noticing. That is a single track interpretation. But today, uh, around a single incident, uh, you have at least multiple and very often dozens, if not hundreds of videos, each one from a different angle. Each one is taken by a different individual with their own perspective, some by the victims, some by the witnesses, some by the perpetrators uh, of that, um, some by the people that resist violence. And... Um, it's the case emerge in the relation between images. So images for us are like, again, like, like doorways. Every photograph has a hinge to another. Sometimes the hinge is a sound. So you, 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 you look at one video and you don't see the perpetrator shooting, but you hear a shot. In the next video, you see a person shooting. In another one, you see an ambulance coming maybe 30 minutes later. In another one, you see people fleeing from a place. In another one, you see a helicopter coming. And, and each one of those videos has a hinge to another. And you need to start weaving those relations. Sometimes we weave relation amongst 800 of different videos. And each one is a different perspective. The closer the weave, the, the closer to verification you get. And, and, and by weaving multiple perspectives, 
in order to weave multiple perspective, what you need is a 3D model. So the model, the architectural part, the architecture kernel of forensic architectures, like you build a 3D model and you start weaving threads through it and those threads intersect. You put all the videos in it and, and only by putting the videos and the cones of vision within the model, you know what's in the frame and what's out of the frame, what's very important in investigation, what is out of the frame, and what's the relation between this video and that video. No, they're looking at a completely different direction, or maybe they're intersecting. Uh, and then you start bringing testimony, and a testimony in our memory is also spatially conditioned. So when we interview witnesses, we walk with them either through the space where something happened or we build 3D environment. We call it situated testimony. And the witness would walk through a space. Perhaps the space no longer exists. Perhaps it's been bombed. Perhaps we don't have access to it. Perhaps it's a prison and therefore we cannot we cannot approach so it anymore. So this is the work about um, Assad's prison uh, yeah. a few miles north of Damascus where yeah. you're having to reconstruct yeah. 40, the space yeah. through... Witness memory and yeah. the witnesses were themselves blindfolded yeah. and being tortured yeah. when they're in this space. Yeah, exactly. So how do you conduct those interviews? I mean This was again one of the most heartbreaking and difficult investigation we've done. I'd, I'd have to say before that we only undertake investigation when we are asked to do so. We never enter the space of other people's trauma uninvited. So when the family or bereaved or survivors ask us to do it, we do it. And and, and five survivors of uh, Assad's torture uh, prison of Sednaya managed to escape to Turkey and wanted to reconstruct their experiences. Sometimes the experiences are not available uh, even to the people that experience something. The closer you get... So this is something that happens with memory. You can remember what happened before the incident. You can remember what happened after. The closer you get to the heart of violence, the more memory protects you. Sometimes you have blackouts. Sometimes things get distorted, elongated. Uh, sometimes things appear in repetition. So if, if maybe there were two doors, but in your memory there have been six doors or eight doors um, between one place and the other. And, and the problem of traumatized memory and the, inner, the, and the fact that memory is disassociated, not available to you, haunts survivors. So survivors that want to do it and understand also the risk of re-traumatization in doing that are effectively entering into a re 3D reconstruction and they help us initially build the model as they know the place. So with the prisoners, you start with a tile. And sometimes they know every stone in the tile because that's what they had to see for days in, days out. And then they know the, 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 the dimensions. And then they've maybe counted how many tiles in each side between the window and the door. And then we can estimate the room and where the window was, if there was a window, where the door was, how big it was, etc. And we start with very technical, we never ask about the painful things. We ask about the small technical thing. How was the handle looking? Was it cold when you touch? Was it warm? Was it long? Was it short? Was it was it high? Was it and memory erupts in an unpredictable way when you come across um, uh, when, when you come across a bit of physical reality that is associated, that the memory is associated, because our memory is spatial. So in one of the cases, one of the witnesses is actually just modeling with, you know, we had a Palestinian model builder. She spoke Arabic. She spoke to the, um, to, to the survivor, and they're trying to size that small hatch in a door of a solitary confinement room and they're talking about the dimension and all of a sudden the memory emerge and you could see it in a voice and you can see it in the pause but it's there and then he recalled that it was in that hatch that he was tortured they asked him to push his head through this hatch and, and beat it from the other side so something like that so horrible um 
would often not be available to witnesses on, upon simple questioning, upon an interview like we, we do that. It's funny like to now. hear you say this because my mom um, worked in child protection for most of her career. Yeah. And one of her specialities was working with child victims of sexual violence. Mm. And one of the things that she'd have to do is work out whether or not this is something that happened or whether this was the result of coaching mm -hmm. or whatever. And she said, mm -hmm. if you try and ask a child, you know, what happened? Where did this person touch you? You're not going to get an answer. And part of that is trauma, right? Their memory won't let them have it. But if you ask about details, like what color were the curtains? Yeah, exactly. Or what was on the duvet? Exactly. Or what was in the corner of the room? These things would be absolutely crystal mm. clear. And so the way of working with these child victims of sexual violence yeah. was to put together a picture of what was in the room, yeah. very much avoiding the act of violence and what the perpetrator looked like or what they were doing exactly. and looking at what was in the peripheral vision. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, there's a very good forensic psychology department at Goldsmiths and we have developed this technique in close conversation with them and, of course, um, victims to sexual different form of sexualized violence uh, we're at the forefront of our thinking of how to avoid a graphic description of things but also how to transfer agency so when you simply ask and answer question is one thing but when I you know you sit together with a model builder and you build together a home and maybe you know we've done that also with survivors of the horrible fire in uh, Grenfell Tower and building those flats and taking the time and putting shelf by shelf and object by object and and then you know slowly the the witness themselves takes the agency there it's their model they are providing that we are just simply technical help in in actually you know doing the sort of the 3d graphics for that. Um, and and the, the 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 empowerment that comes with it, with control over you know a kind of uh, the situation, also empowers and allows um, allows the witnesses. Sometimes it's it's never a rule to uh, to to arrive at at recollections that are so much more precise, and sometimes to bypass the lacunae and and um, and. You know gaps within within the recollection. So architecture is not only a kind of like, oh, forensic arc is not only like a remote practice of trying to do you know looking at satellite images from afar. It's a practice of attunement, of working closely with community members, of working closely with survivors or, or people at the forefront of struggles, um, both on the material investigation and on the memory reconstruction of things. So going back to the Syrian prison for just a moment, you're working with multiple survivors and you're reconstructing the space from their memories, their sense of the tile, their memory of, of you know, where the door was. Does that mean you're building multiple different models based on each individual's memory or are you trying to build a model based on where you find the overlap and corroboration between different accounts. Yeah, this is this. It depends, but um, there is different forms of collective reconstruction that we work with. So here is one example. We're working with our uh, Ukrainian partners on the Mariupol Drama Theater, bombed on the sixteenth of March. Uh, we soon in the. Uh, uh, what is that? Second anniversary, or third, second anniversary. Sorry, of that of that bombing, and um, about a dozen witnesses. Each one furnishes the model of the of the theater with the blankets, the chairs, the utensils, and we're reconstructing a sense of um, together with with our partners, the Center for Spatial Technology in, in Kiev. Reconstructing a sense of a community, uh, what we call a city in within a building, everything that was in a city entered into and was folded into this one building. They had participatory democracy. They had schools. They had care. They had hospital. They were cooking together and 
making collective decisions, etc. And now we wanted to do a collective reconstruction of what has happened. And therefore, uh, the first witness comes and gives testimony and places objects. Perhaps for the second witness, those objects are the hinge to their recollection. So what you see at the end is the sum total of all recollection. Each person has seen a part of the building and experienced part of it, and together that formed into uh, a kind of an understanding of what has happened. In Namibia, when we were asked by Ova Herrero and Nama groups to help uh, in a case demanding reparation for colonial crimes, for the colonial genocide, for the German colonial genocide uh, of the turn of the 20th century, the witnesses are no longer direct witnesses because we're talking 120 years later. So maybe they are the grandchildren or great grandchildren. Uh, what they're giving is oral tradition as as a testimony and also unlike in kind of northern jurisprudence you know where you have a single witness need to be isolated we did those reconstructions collectively where people were building from inherited memories from their ancestors or you know grandparents um, villages we found cemeteries um, the environment the way it was because the natural environment has been completely transformed by the, in the, by the process of colonization so that form so architecture allowed for a kind of a, a communal form of reconstruction that in itself offered a communal voice in that that contests that kind of cartographic violence of uh, of of empire and but, colonization I mean, thinking about the mariupol theater for a second Every time you access a memory, every time you touch a memory, you kind of run the risk of changing it somehow. Of course. And so if I'm looking at a model of a place where I've been and there have been things placed in it from other people's memories, I might remember it even if I didn't see it. So how do you deal with or account for, I guess, memory contamination which is someone shares a memory and something's perhaps misremembered or jumbled up with something else. Someone else interacts with the model and goes, oh, yes, that was my memory, even if, you know. Yeah, the best is in the weave, cross-referencing multiple testimonies allows you to, co to corroborate and allows you also to correct. And it's not, it's not coming to offend anyone. You say, well, you know, um, somebody else suggested it might be here. Do you, do you maybe... Um, uh, want to consider that, uh, etc. But there's other more, um, there's a process in which we work by which you do not walk within a fully immersive reality. We create an alienation effect between the viewer and the model. So we start with very low tech, very low grade models from you know the 1980s era of like CAD, computer aided design where they would not kind of, you couldn't mistake them for the real thing. They're simply about distances and movement. And slowly, we would build into it, just like you build a face, you'd build a texture and you'd build a, and so, so very, very slowly, you add the kind of the immersive elements to it. Uh, only after you've been content that you're not actually implanting memories uh, in somebody else's uh, mind. But of course, every retelling, every time you tell a story, you remember the story, you remember what you originally remember, and you remember the telling of the story, and the retelling of the story, and the retelling of the story, and the retelling of the story. So this is this is an issue that is uh, structural to, to, to memory. And it is, um, you know, in, in all types of testimony, it applies. And therefore, what is important in general is to say memory or a case is an act of construction. We, we are, you know, here there's another kind of architecture, dimension to forensic architecture. You take a piece of memory, a trace evidence, a bit of material reality, uh, another recollection, another video, and you start building and you start seeing where they intersect. However, something that is really, really important, and you mentioned error. Errors are really important for us. 
because with witnesses who are exposed to extreme trauma, the error is what we call informationally enriched. What does it mean? Um, again, in Sudnaya, one of our witnesses, by that time, after cross-referencing the, the testimony and understanding the building, we knew that person was being tortured in a straight corridor. But that person testified that he remembered being surrounded, being in a hall, in a round hall. Now, it's probably not possible. But where is the roundness of the hall? Where does this architecture come from? The architecture comes from a sense, perhaps, of being totally incarcerated, being completely surrounded and looked at, being claustrophobically, being claustrophobically enclosed, meaning the error confirms the veracity of trauma. So the error confirmed sometimes could confirm the truth more than a simple Cartesian description. So you keep the errors as precious deposits of faith uh, and you don't dismiss them. Because they're telling you, you about read, someone's experience. You, yeah, exactly. The errors is the errors is, is, is where you connect to somebody's personality and experience uh, of a particular incident. So these are really precious deposits for us. One of the things that I found most fascinating about the Syrian prison investigation was the way in which you were having to work with memory, which very often didn't have a visual component to it. So can you tell me a bit about how your investigators worked with the memory of sound? So one of our, you know, really precious uh, collaborators uh, is an audio investigator called Lawrence Abu Hamdan, who was also, uh, you know, a student in, at our Goldsmith Center for many years and a very close friend, and now started uh, his own organization called Earshot. And Lawrence is exactly understanding that there's so much information in sound and to be tuned to sound, listening to sound, can reveal so much more than what we think. And uh, effectively, the witnesses that came into the prison either had to press their hands against their eyes or were blindfolded or were forced to keep their head down. So most of their experience of incarceration was through sound. And they were hearing multiple things through the, the prison. They were hearing the muffled voice of torture that were happening in other places in the building, moving through the ventilation system. They were listening to doors opening and closing, to footsteps, and Lawrence was reconstructing with them those sounds. Lawrence was playing to them um, the sound of a door opening and they were adjusting it, just like you adjust the kind of the face or, or the models that we were saying before. They said, yes, that's the right sound. And then through the sound, they, you know, the kind of the memory got reconstructed through this, you know, the kind of the rhythm of being there is the door, is the key in the door. And that became kind of like an entry point into other recollections. Or, for example, Lawrence was trying to find out the, the dimension of spaces and audio contains any, and you know, our voice or recording of our voice contains the architecture of that room because the weight bounces. And if you listen it carefully, you will know how big it is, how high it is, or maybe you can approximate it. So Lawrence was giving in the computer different kind of acoustic properties to rooms in order to reconstruct what people heard rather than seen. And, and a lot of the model that you see is actually coming from uh, um, audio testimonies. Um, and it's audio reconstruction of architecture. And I find that, you know, our commitment to visuality sometimes blinds us, sometimes does not allow us to see, or so to see again, you see like I'm, I'm kind of trampling over my own words, but uh, to, to be tuned um, to audio. And uh, later we were working with Lawrence Abu Hamdan on the Israeli targeted killing of Shirin Abu Akleh, by the Palestinian journalist uh, from Al Jazeera. And it was really through him listening to the sound of the shots 
a sound of a shot have what you call a crack and a boom the moment in which the you know the the, the sound that comes from the gun itself and the sound could come from the supersonic bullet that passes by your by your uh, audio um, uh, sensor mm-hmm. and the distance between them would show you uh, how far the shot was taken, sometimes even from which direction. And the reconstruction, the audio reconstruction that Lawrence and Earshot has done for that investigation really kind of added a very crucial dimension to what forensic architecture did in in this act of reconstruction. And, and I think that this is probably one of the ways in which our field could evolve because when we talk about open source analysis, we talk about satellite images and videos, very often investigators switch the audio off when they look at videos. And that's a mistake because every video that a witness records of a battlefield or a crime scene you know, includes something of the voice. People say something, people cry, people shout, people pray. And they deliver testimony that is superimposed, if you like, over the evidence that you see in the video. You hear their description. So it's kind of testimony without memory, mm-hmm. if you if you like, and, and extremely important. At some, at some investigations, we just make this exercise. We say, let's just listen to those dozens of videos. Let's just listen very, very carefully to what people say when they record it and build something else. And I think that open source investigation must absolutely learn to, to, to be tuned and to, be, um, to have attention to, to sound. And so when, when we, you know, forensic architecture is not now a single group. We are what we call the investigative commons. The investigative commons includes Earshot, it includes Index in Paris, it includes all these other organizations around the world. And each one does something slightly different. You know, partners of us are doing kind of like forensics of plans. Uh, looking at traces of dispossession, for example, in the Amazon, Paulo Tavares, um, one of our you know dearest members, is 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 understanding where indigenous villages were simply by seeing the difference in the in the in the in the secondary growth forest, um, uh, you know, a place where the village was. It was a clearing, so you can actually see the 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 roads the routes and the and the villages by looking at plants uh, and that is so there's multiple ways in which the principle of close attention to signal um, to voice to testimony to plants to audio can can actually uh, increase our sensitivity to the world is there perhaps different rates of degradation associated with different senses that you're invoking for memory? Because I think sometimes my visual memory can be quite vulnerable to manipulation. Mm. So I can quite easily convince myself Mm. that someone's t-shirt was red when it was blue or Mm -hmm. the car was this when it was that. But sound is very difficult to shift in my memory. I can say it sounded like that and it didn't sound like that. And I can hold that for a long time. Mm. And the other one is smell. Like I was recently, uh, you know, met someone, I gave them a hug and I breathed in and I was like, oh my God, you smell exactly like my best friend from when I was nine years old. And the memory came as clear as day. Mm. Yeah. Um, like when you're, when you're working with witnesses, do you ever sort of rank the senses that they're invoking. You go, okay, well, well, visual might be a bit vulnerable here, but this other thing they're talking about, that seems really mm. certain. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, there are different memory triggers and obviously sound and smell are very connected to memories or to deep memories and, and allow repressed memories or not repressed, simply things that you haven't thought about to kind of come to the surface. Um, but I think that, a sense of space is not exactly visual space. A sense of space includes audio. Uh, it includes the acoustics. It may include smell. It includes the temperature. So space includes all of those. We tend to think about space as simply a visual thing. But when forensic architecture 
build 3D models for memory reconstruction. They definitely include the audio uh, dimension to them. And um, it is clear that to us also that sense of space, of being at a particular disposition in relation to a particular room with a door open or closed, etc., cetera, uh, can function very well as, as memory triggers. Our memory is very spatial. And, um, you know, this is why you have things like memory palaces, et cetera, where you meander through a preconceived environment and kind of pick up objects that, that would remind you of things. I think I've got a memory shack. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a palace. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, also, I also find that in those memory palaces, Something strange happened in them that I think was not really recognized by the people that conceived this art of memory the, in the in the classic and in the in the Renaissance period, is that you can take you can't absolutely not take the same room and walk through it several times and place different objects in it and because you know this is how they did they they did it like the great orators of Rome, no? They had like the building and they were putting in one room a fountain, in one a dagger, in one a bed, in one a plant, and each one each one object was supposed to remind them of a, of a topic that they wanted to speak about. But when you take the plant from a room and you put inside of this, uh, I don't know, wooden horse in there, you'd enter again into this room and the room would be haunted by the plant. <laughs> Sometimes the plant would reappear in the wrong speech. Um, sometimes it would flicker on and off. Uh, or the, the horse and the plant would kind of like go and do something else together. <laughs> so, so, you know, memory is so plastic and malleable that the, the idea of a, of a static memory is completely um, uh, legend. I mean, at the moment, forensic architecture is working kind of in real time particularly looking at claims being made by the Israeli government and the Israeli army about what it's doing in Gaza. So Forensic Architecture recently released an investigation showing that I think on eight occasions Israel misrepresented visual data in its submission to the International Court of Justice. From the work you're doing at the moment and your vantage point, what, if anything, is different about Israel's assault on Gaza after October the 7th compared to previous offensives? Uh, I mean, this is really bringing me into, um, yeah, what has been the most difficult, I think, time for us as an organization and also the most difficult time for me. Um, we obviously had uh, partners in Gaza, uh, an organization called Ein Media. Uh, when the Israeli assault began, we were looking for our partners. Uh, contact has been lost with them. People were looking for them on the ground. Our friends were looking for them on the ground. We were looking amongst hundreds, sometimes, you know, of, of videos until we were finding something concerning and um, passed it on. Then the director of this organization. Um, yeah, uh, his home was targeted and uh, on the 22nd of October and um, he was killed, leaving his um, wife and, and toddler child. Do you think um, he was targeted deliberately? He was, um, I think his, at least his father was. His father was the mayor of Gaza. Uh, and, and they were thinking they were safe there and he was, he was targeted. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the strike was a targeted strike. So you could say he was murdered. Um, we were working very closely with the Al-Haq Forensic Architecture Unit. I just came back from Ramallah, uh, spending time with them, looking at the investigation. They're working independently also around the clock. Uh, incredible work that they're doing under very, very difficult conditions because, I mean, you just heard a couple of days ago the biggest raid of Ramallah has happened. Um, the office has been raided in the past before the is before October seventh, um, based on this spurious wrong accusation that they're a terrorist group, uh, and they are just 
you know, afraid of every knock on the door or staying late at night because the Israelis raid at night, uh, those officers. So it's been extremely difficult. Um, we have also Palestinians working with us in London who have families in Gaza who have lost dozens of loved ones. Um, very strange. I mean, I guess for you too, because, you know, we are all living through this, this absolutely horrible uh, living through genocide is something that is is so difficult and, you know, demand of us to be at our best uh, in terms of empathy, in terms of concentration, in terms of speed, in terms of accuracy of what we do. We do not maybe have time to package our investigation in the same way, but we need to respond when we ask. We need to work with our partners. We need to check on our friends. Um, and uh, it's difficult. So... We have, uh, and, and you know, the sense of being able, when I see my colleagues sometimes speaking on a phone with their family in Gaza, that sense of, of disconnect is kind of like closing because, you know, we, we with them uh, in, that, in that way, um, speaking almost like picking up a phone and calling people who are experiencing genocide. Uh, this is something that is, is extremely hard to kind of like understand. But of course, anyone that works on it, including yourself, you know it's possible and, and it's done. I think for me, there's a heightened sense of unreality because I'm in London and I'm surrounded yeah. by my London friends and a London lifestyle. And I wonder if for you guys at Forensic Architecture, you're working with partners in Gaza and you're also looking at footage before it gets to be packaged in any way, mm. unlike me. Mm. What, in what ways does that change the work you're doing? Mm. I mean, does the emotional mm. context you're in change the work you're doing? Yeah, I mean, we, we just know too many people there. And sometimes you're looking at, uh, at an event of a bombing or shooting of of people that, that that you know and you've spoken to, uh, and that's this is um, it's always difficult with anyone with any person that who, on, on whose behalf we are working, but that that just makes it um, slightly more and the scale of which and the, the amount of devastation um, is just is just incredible. So you know we we completely reconfigure the way we work. We don't work the way we have. Um, we have organized ourselves to do two things, really. One is, is to um, deconstruct Israeli evidence and to show, we call it somehow negative evidence uh, in shorthand. No? So we, we do work that uh, in order to explain to people internationally that what you see and the claims that you are being uh, the address of are not are very often incorrect, they are manipulative, and they are um, wrong, and that there need to be a level of scrutiny over those things, particularly when, Israeli, when the Israeli team is presenting its evidence in the world court, uh, and it's presenting uh, material that is simply clumsy, wrong, manipulative, and, and, and then false claims are being made on that to justify the level of atrocities that we're seeing because evidence is not only something that comes to judge after the fact. Evidence is an intervention in an ongoing genocide, in an ongoing conflict. Legitimacy is, is the tank of gas within, within which Israel can continue its assault in the way it wants to continue its assault. You need to challenge it because you need to make sure that its, that, that its actions are seen as illegitimate and that other parties in, in the world, whether they're courts or whether they're other governments in, the, in Latin America, in Europe, in, uh, in, or the people here saying, this is illegitimate. And, um, and too often videos of atrocities or false representation of the deny atrocities function as adding just a little bit more petrol in the tank 
of this genocidal machine. And you need to stop that. And this is why we work on what we call negative evidence, disproving, challenging, checking very, very carefully the statements that Israel is doing. And, you know, we could show that, you know, the Israeli military spokesperson can point to an explosion in the air and say this is um, an Islamic Jihad rocket later hit al Ahli hospital. And we say, no, this is impossible. Uh, the, the, the explosion in the air is an interceptor and anyway it wouldn't have you know it couldn't fall to the ground from five kilometers uh, in seven seconds no so just making sure that that they cannot say anything because saying rhetorics is a license to continue that horrible destruction of Gaza and the destruction of Gaza is it's not even that you need here at this moment architectural evidence because everything is being destroyed cities are being leveled it's not about saying oh that building has been destroyed by this bomb or that bomb you know we all seeing images of Gaza the infrastructure is uprooted the ground the 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 orchards the greenhouses the um, the buildings, the roads, the beaches, everything is upturned. Um, and um, so the the kind of like trying to, you find yourself at lost about where to actually intervene, what it is that you want to show uh, in a situation like that. But we felt that hospital, particularly in this, and you ask what is the difference here and, you know, the level of destruction being one. I mean, Israel always felt that collective punishment of Palestinian people uh, is in its interest. It's always used um, designated target to create collateral damage, but it's, there's an inversion. The collateral is the target. This is actually what they, they aim to terrorize the population from um, creating enough fear that they would lose the wish to resist, which I think that it, it never happened before, not, not historically with no people, definitely did not happen with Palestinians and certainly not in Gaza, but still there is that idea that you'd terrorize the population into submission. Um, but you have, um, so the logic of destruction is is one, but what what really is different in this in this attack, what may, one of the key elements that make it a genocidal attack is the attacks on hospitals. And hospitals, the attack on those institutions that need to provide care and resi resilience, these institutions that allow a society, allow people to live, you take them away and you destroy the, the capacity of people to live in a particular place. But also another thing that is important about hospitals, hospitals are centers of information. Whereas if you're in a building and you can experience what happened to you in that building, you can know what you hear and what you see out of the window. Hospitals are places where people gather from afar. And when people gather with their wounded, or with their dead, they come with their stories. So the hospitals are centers of information. These hospitals are nexus from which to understand that the place, the optics from which you see uh, what's happening around it's is like, like radar. It's like knocking out a data center. Exactly, in some, in some way. And, and to a certain extent, we find that right now speaking to Palestinians about and, and, and soliciting testimonies while the genocide is happening is going to put people under risk. But there's a lot of uh, medical doctors, a lot of surgeons and other medical practitioners who go in and sometimes out of Gaza, who are privileged witnesses, not in the sense that they're privileged people, but in terms of their privilege to information that other do not have. So uh, a medical doctor is both a, a witness to the wound, they're witness to the story that comes with it, and to what they're seeing around themselves. And I think that medical testimony here in this particular in, in this particular case is going to be absolutely crucial in establishing the facts because these are the data centers, as you're saying. I've got one last question. And it's if there was one skill that journalists like me 
could take from forensic architecture, what would you want it to be? I would say attention. Attention and attunement to details, to looking at things, to listening, to finding value in errors, in description, in to blur, and even in pixelation. Um, and to understand that looking and listening is hard work. So there's deep, there's deep looking as there is deep listening. And we need to increase our sensibilities. We need to be attuned to the world. And this is painful because the signals that we get from the world are the you know, heartbreaking signals of trauma and, and pain. And it's painful to open yourself up to those signals, to make yourself sensitive to them is also opening yourself to pain. But only through that you're able to notice things that are otherwise simply flattened in a two-dimensional description or in a two-dimensional reading of a situation. Isle Weitzman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that conversation.